You know, the winter can be full of fun and celebration. Join us as we take a look at some time-saving recipes, easy decorating tips, and interesting history. It's all coming up right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. I've got a treat for you today. We're in this beautiful house that's completely decked out for the holidays, and we're going to focus on the winter holidays. And what we'll see here are some beautiful and bold ornaments, all made with natural materials, such as these magnolia leaves and large balls made with pine cones. And then, of course, there are the poinsettias. Everywhere you turn, beautiful displays of red, pink, and white poinsettia. Now, we'll touch on those a little later in the show. But for now, I wanted to focus on some fun holiday projects. You know, during the winter, and especially around holiday time, well, we're all short on time. So these projects really don't take much time at all. They're really quite simple. But there's no reason to tell your neighbors. They'll think you spent hours on them. If you're looking for something that's new, an alternative, say, to the traditional Christmas wreath for your front door, you might try a swag of greenery. Now this doesn't take much time to do. In fact, you can use things right out of the garden and a few things around the house, like a coat hanger and chicken wire. You can use a variety of materials and the results can be beautiful. I just put this one together. Let me show you how I did it. First, I took a heavy duty coat hanger and pulled it into a diamond shape and covered it with one inch mesh chicken wire. Then I took the ends of the chicken wire and wrapped them around the frame of the coat hanger. I cut enough evergreen to make six bundles, and I secured each one of them with a pipe cleaner. Then I covered the wire frame with them, starting at the bottom and working my way to the top. I used branches from this Leyland Cypress, but any evergreen will do. You might try boxwood, holly, or even eucalyptus. I accented the frame with two bundles of red berries, and added some apples. To attach the apples, I pierced them through the core and ran a pipe cleaner through them, and then tied them to the frame. And then to finish it off, I used a festive plaid bow. When it comes to what you attach to the greenery, use your imagination. With this frame, you can use anything you want. There are many symbols of this holiday season, but probably one of the oldest is the wreath. Now you don't have to use traditional Christmas or holiday greens to create a wreath. You can use a lot of things. For instance, I'm making a wreath using some eucalyptus and a few lemons. If you've ever made one of these, you know that the toughest part is creating the perfect circle or the frame. Well, I just bypass this part and use an artificial wreath. It's one of the best uses I've found for these things. If you use one of these, try to find one where the stems are made of wire. You can twist them and bend them like this. You'll find this very handy when you're attaching the real stuff. All you'll need to get started are some pipe cleaners, tools for cutting, some ribbon, and greenery and fruit of your choice. To begin with, I'm using another evergreen across the back. In this case, I'm using Leyland Cypress, but just about anything will do. This will fill in the back of the wreath and also provide some textural contrast. I stick the ends of the eucalyptus into the frame and tie them down with the wire stems. Then I overlap them around the wreath all in the same direction. And finally, I pierce the lemons and attach them with pipe cleaners. Then just tie on a big bow. Now these may not be the traditional colors of the holidays, but the aromatic combination of the fresh eucalyptus and lemons is hard to beat. Not only is this tree colossal, it's beautiful. And you can imagine it took a little time to put this together. But you know, there's some things that you can do with your tree at home, no matter the size, that'll give it that extra special look. You've no doubt seen the beautifully decorated Christmas trees in storefronts and in florists. And you may think, I don't know that I can achieve that. Well, actually, there's some tips that the professionals use in decorating Christmas trees that we can apply at home. Let me show you a few of them. 
To help keep a tree fresh through the holidays, I always recut the trunk and cut into the end of it with a hatchet to help it draw up more moisture before I put it into its stand. Decorating begins with the lights. If you're using some from last year, make sure there are no broken bulbs or frayed wires. A word of warning here, many professionals when decorating a Christmas tree use a lot of lights, but the technique is pretty simple. You see, they start at the top and work their way to the bottom. They also wrap each individual limb, starting at the trunk, wrapping it around the spine of the limb, out to the tip. Now, when you start wrapping, make sure that you follow the same pattern all the way around the tree. This makes the distribution of the lights more uniform and easier to take off after the holidays. I always string the lights with them on, and I find it easier to work with shorter strings, say 35 to 50, and I never connect more than six strings together. I wasn't kidding when I said it takes a lot of lights. I've already used over 300, and I'm not even halfway finished. But if you use this technique, you won't be disappointed with the results. You know, there's so many wonderful holidays during the winter. Of course, there's Christmas. Then there's Hanukkah, and let's not forget Ramadan, a very special time of year for the Islamic faith but also one that has a fascinating tie to the ancient calendar. To help explain this special time of year, I visited with Iman Mossad at a local mosque. <laughs> Throughout the month at night, the, if you go to any mosque in the world in the evening, that it'll be filled with the recitation of Quran uh, from you know the beginning to the end. Ramadan is actually the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar, and Ramadan is a month where Muslims they fast, in which they abstain from food, drink, from dawn until sunset. And so Ramadan is a special month for fasting as well as for increased study of the Qur'an. The Islamic calendar is based on, on a lunar schedule. So that means uh, a lunar month is either 29 or 30 days determined by when the new crescent is born. So as you can tell, the solar calendar or the Gregorian calendar, which is used in the West, that it has some months 31, some months 30, some months 29. So what eventually happens is you have a gap of 11 days between a lunar calendar and a solar calendar. So the lunar calendar shifts by 11 days relative to the solar calendar. As such, Ramadan and each Islamic month, they kind of rotate throughout the whole year. <laughs> so eventually you will have fasted through all seasons. After 30 days of fasting, um, then on the last day of Ramadan, then uh, the Muslims begin preparing for what will happen on the first day of the next month. On that day, there's a celebration uh, for having accomplished this achievement. And then the kids and the families, you know, they visit one another and there's a lot of, um, you know, just joy um, on that day. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Kirishanu B'mitzvotav, V'tzivanu L'halikner Shel Chanukah. The English is Praised are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the world, who has given us commandments to light the Hanukkah lights. The light uh, is symbolic not only of the eight days of the holiday itself, but light in its kind of cultural way that, uh, the, that the Jewish people can help be a light unto the nations. And uh, light is such an important part of this holiday. You drive around the neighborhoods and you see you know, homes decorated with lights, and you have the Yule log. The quality of the holiday seems to increase from day to day. As you see the, like on the first night, you light one candle. On the second night, you light two candles. On the third night, you light three. 
the last night, the eighth night, you have the entire menorah is lit with candles. You have the, the eight lights already in. You're lighting them with the ninth one, and then you can conclude by wishing everybody a happy Hanukkah and you look forward to next year. As I remember, most of the holidays of cultures around the world at this time of the year, uh, from the end of November to the end of December, have lights as, as part of their ritual. The second one is, Praised are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the world, who did wondrous deeds for us, at this season in years past. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech olam, she'asah nisim lavoteinu, bayamim ha'ahem ba'azman hazeh. Speaking of light, the shortest day of the year, or the day with the least amount of light, is the winter solstice. From the beginning, we've been fascinated by these changing seasons. Now, if you'd like to commemorate this day of light and dark, as so many have before us, you might try creating a Yule log. Yule logs were started back in Europe, and the idea behind it was to burn a log at Christmas for good luck. The longer the log burned, the better your luck would be in the new year. Sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? It's a lot of fun to decorate a Yule log with things from the garden that are also rich in symbolism, like holly. You see, the spiny points on the leaves of holly were thought to represent Christ's crown of thorns and the berries' drops of blood. And like much of the other greenery we use, the holly is also evergreen, symbolic of everlasting life. Now, mistletoe, another evergreen, can also be used, and we tend to associate it with kissing. But the Romans believed it to be a symbol of peace. And my Yule log isn't complete without the evergreen herb rosemary. It's named for the Virgin Mary, and she's thought to be responsible for changing its flowers from white to blue. Maybe this year you'll start your own family tradition of burning a Yule log and invite your holiday guests to bring items from the garden to use in decorating it. You know, I have to say I really get into this time of year. It's the perfect time to reach out into the garden and find natural beauties to bring indoors to enjoy. Everything from pine cones and evergreen boughs. And you certainly don't want to forget about some of those dried elements. Beyond the garden, the grocery stores are full of amazing items that during the winter you can make wonderful decorations from, such as apples, nuts, citrus, and even artichokes. Yes, you can find a way to work just about anything into an arrangement. Okay, now let's take a look over here at another holiday favorite, the poinsettia. <laughs> If you're like me, when that holiday countdown begins, you look for every opportunity to save time. So how about a simple idea for a holiday table centerpiece that requires only a few things, and many of them you may have around the house. The great thing about this idea is it only takes a few minutes to put together. It all starts with a wreath, a poinsettia, and a few apples as the main attractions. You start with a large dinner plate or tray and place a fresh greenery wreath over it. In the center of the wreath, place four or five small jars, almost full of water. Now for the poinsettias. I always buy an extra plant for projects like these for cutting the flowers. You see, the plant itself is too tall to use in a table centerpiece, so I just cut the stems about four to six inches long. As soon as the flowers are removed, I burn the ends of the stems. I'm using a lighted candle. You see, burning seals the milky sap of the plant in the stem, which will keep the flower from wilting. You'll be amazed at how long these blooms will last in water. I simply arrange the flowers in the center of the wreath to create a low mound effect using slightly taller ones in the center and the outer ones overlapping onto the wreath. Now this is ready to place on the table. And once it's in position, I'll accent it with some of these Granny Smith apples, a little extra greenery, and some small votive candles. I'm partial to this white and green theme, but you can choose any color you like. Another great thing about this arrangement is that it will last for a long time. Mmm, not too bad. You know, this time of year there's so much food everywhere, and I love it. I thought I'd share with you some of my favorite recipes for winter. They're simple and time-saving. Let's start with a recipe that uses this herb, rosemary. It's always interesting to me 
how certain produce, like these winter squash, are so durable. Many of them, if handled correctly, can literally last all winter. These squash also supply us with a rich source of vitamin A. And in the case of this butternut squash, lots of beta carotene. Just look at its bright orange flesh under the skin. Butternut squash is one of those signature flavors of autumn, particularly when you combine it with some savory herbs and honey. Now this recipe is so simple, and the way the honey caramelizes with the squash takes the flavor right off the charts. Butternut has always been one of my favorites, but I've found that any of the winter squash are just as delicious prepared this way. I'm starting with two pounds of winter squash. That's two squash that are medium to large like these, and I'm splitting them in half. You'll want to remove the seeds, but you don't have to bother peeling them. Then cut the squash into quarter inch slices. Transfer the pieces into a bowl and thoroughly coat each piece with honey. You'll need about four tablespoons. Next, overlap the slices in a shallow baking dish and drizzle the remainder of the honey over the top. Dot four tablespoons of salted butter over the squash and sprinkle it with one teaspoon of chopped fresh rosemary. Bake this at 375 degrees for about 40 minutes. Butternut squash served this way can make a superb addition to any fall menu. One aspect of the holiday season I always look forward to is enjoying some of those once a year treats that we reserve for special occasions, like hot mulled cider. I start by adding eight cups or two quarts of apple juice to a large pot, along with two cups of orange juice, one cup of pineapple juice, and a half a cup of lemon. Now you can substitute the apple juice with apple cider. You see the difference between cider and juice officially is the cider is slightly fermented, which makes it a bit effervescent, and it contains a percent of alcohol. Now with all of the juices combined, I'm ready to add a little sugar and spice. Add to the brew a half a cup of brown sugar, two cinnamon sticks, two teaspoons of cloves, one teaspoon of allspice, and one tablespoon of powdered ginger. Now cook all of this over a medium heat until it begins to boil and then let it simmer for about 15 minutes longer. Mmm, as you can imagine, with all these spices, the aroma is incredible. And what better way to have your entire home smell like the holidays? And what a delicious treat for friends and family when they drop in. Now to finish it off, I'll just garnish with a few fresh orange slices. You know, this recipe makes enough for 10. But the best part about this recipe is that you can make it days ahead, so you can have it on hand when you're ready to entertain. Well, we're almost out of time for our Garden Home Show for the holidays. So before we end, I thought it'd be good to talk about the new year. You may be thinking, what does the new year have to do with the garden? Well, we can't forget about vineyards and, of course, champagne for ringing in the new year. To learn more about wine and champagne, I visited Chateau Julian, a charming and beautiful landscape winery nestled in the rolling hills of Central California's Carmel Valley. Winemaker Bill Anderson shared with me some of his thoughts about these fruits of the vine. Bill, why is champagne traditionally served cold? I think uh, champagne has traditionally been served cold mainly because that's the way people like it. But on a more technical basis, the reason it's cold is because you want to keep the carbon dioxide that's in the champagne in solution. And if it's not cold and it's warm, then the bubbles are all going to froth out of the bottle and you won't have a whole lot of liquid left. Why is champagne the drink of celebration? Well, I think it goes back to the very beginning of champagne with Dom Perignon uh, centuries ago when he, by accident, made champagne. He didn't know he had done that. And when he drank it, he went to the other monks or the brothers and he said, brothers, brothers, I'm, I'm drinking stars. So I think from the very beginning, because it was so special, because it was so exciting, it's always been considered a special wine. The main difference between sparkling wine and champagne as we know it is champagne, the name champagne, is French and the French believe that if it's not made in the region of champagne it cannot be called champagne even though the sparkling wine that we make for instance in California is made exactly in the same manner, the same grapes and the same process, it's just that the French feel that we should not call it champagne. 
All this talk of champagne and celebration has me reminiscing about New Year's past. A few years ago, I found myself in New York around the first of the year, and I started to think about how foods and the holidays really go together. And I was longing for some good food, good old southern black-eyed peas and turnip greens, reminders of my grandmother Smith's garden when I was a kid. Now this is Amy Ruth's, a soul food restaurant owned by Chef Carl Redding, a kindred spirit when it comes to down-home cooking. So these, these are your custom black-eyed peas? These are our custom black-eyed peas. Uh, we use fresh black-eyed peas. Uh, they don't come any fresher than this. Beautiful, beautiful. Color, texture, yeah, um, everything. Now I promise I wash my hands. Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> now the black-eyed pea is a, is a tradition in my family and in my part of the world down in the south. Well, here too, uh, most of the, uh, our customers uh, most of Harlem uh, sort of migrated to the north from the south, right. so uh, the same traditions uh, uh, apply here in New York. So having black-eyed peas on New Year's Day oh, a is a tradition. Item. you got to have that Absolutely. for good luck Absolutely. in the New Year. Absolutely. <laughs> well, tell me about your recipe. I want to well, get this. Uh, simple recipe, simple ingredients. We start off uh, by using a chicken stock. I see, so it's cooked in chicken broth. Right, a chicken broth. And uh, we season it with uh, a little crushed red pepper. We use an ingredient here in New York. It's a simple mixture of salt, pepper, uh, paprika, uh, garlic, and onion. And then we use a uh, garlic powder to give it that extra flavor. Now I can see you're real picky about how much you use there. Well, you know. <laughs> this is I, the art of cooking, absolutely. isn't it? Yeah, the artiste is applying his absolutely. ingredients at will. And then we use a, a, a uh, I said garlic powder, and then right. we use an onion, onion powder. I see. And it looks like with each one of those ingredients, you're, you're putting in about a fourth of a cup. I would say about a fourth of a cup. It depends on how much you're cooking. Right. Of course. And. Uh, a little uh, canola oil uh, to right. help it cook a little bit faster. And then, of course, you have to have some type of uh, meat uh, uh, flavor. So here at Amy Ruth's, we use a smoked turkey wing. I see. Smoked turkey part. And uh, I generally cook my black eyed peas, I would say, an hour, an hour and 15 minutes uh, on a. It's a, a medium low heat, heat or a low, low heat? A low heat. I see. For about an hour. And uh, they'll come out soft and tasty every time. And oh, so delicious. Oh, so delicious. <laughs> Very good. Well, I can't wait to taste them. Of course, you can't have black eyed peas without collard greens. No, you cannot. <laughs> Show me how you put them together. We use a cider vinegar. Oh, OK. Gives it that extra flavor, crushed red pepper, the same salt, pepper, paprika mixture, adobo. Very generous with the adobo. Yes, it gives a better flavor. Onion powder. Yeah. Garlic powder. I'm gonna Use give you a little trick. Well. Little uh, canola oil again. So Help you've it. used essentially the same ingredients you used for the black eyed peas, except you've it's added the cider vinegar. The cider vinegar and the brown sugar. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. The brown sugar. And that's Very it. Good. I mean, Gosh. it's a simple recipe. Again, I let this cook for about one and a half hours to two hours. Oh my goodness. Carl, gosh, what a feast. This is beautiful. I'm gonna try these, these greens. Mmm, mmm. Carl, these are some kind of good. <laughs> Thank right. you. Man, I'm gonna try the peas now. Okay. Blue Ribbon. Happy Blue New Year. Blue Ribbon. Happy New Year to you. <laughs> yeah. With well, a meal like this, you couldn't help but have good luck That's the next right. year. That's right. Now, before we say goodbye, I want to send a special wish from my garden to yours for health happiness and prosperity in the new year. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com.